thank you everybody for joining us uh, again at court 2023 i hope you had a chance to visit the exhibit hall i hope you had a chance to visit my exhibit because today and tomorrow i am gifting anyone who's interested with the divorcing religion workbook you can download it from my uh, exhibit mary byler is our next speaker today Mary is the manager and founder of the Misfit Amish, an organization dedicated to providing secular support and resources to Amish and ex-Amish survivors. She is also an educator and advocate for Amish children. I had the pleasure of meeting Mary in person recently to explore the potential for setting up some secular recovery centers in the USA, and I appreciate the passion that Mary brings to recognizing religious trauma and the need for recovery. Her talk today is an Amish baptism. Welcome, Mary. I'm glad to see you again. Hi. It's very nice to see you again, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, with, with that being said, I, I like to start out by giving a little bit of Amish background. I was born into an Ape Troyer Amish church. I went in, on to live in four other Amish settlements. They were all old order Amish, but they were all distinctly different. There's a large amount of diversity in Amish settlements, and it's important to recognize that. I escaped in 2004, and yesterday I realized, to my surprise, I, I can't really like escape being here. It's not optional. You know, I, I kind of made a commitment. And, um, you know, I had to get in here and speak. But here we are. I'm sure all of you are just as disappointed as I am to learn that. And once you've shed our disappointment, we got it out of the way. We're over it. I am very honored to be speaking here. Thank you for having me. I just want to say that throughout the years, I have spoken publicly about abuse within Amish homes and settlements. I published a book in 2022. It's called Reflections and Memories of an Amish Misfit. My therapist says that's not true, but I digress. I felt that I couldn't adequately describe what unbaptism meant to me and why I chose to do it publicly without giving you some background. First, we will discuss three main parts, the background of what my Amish baptism looked like and what I experienced, the reasons why I wrote my unbaptism, how I performed my unbaptism ritual and why I share it with others. And if there's enough time, there's also a recording. To begin with the background, it's again important to note that depending on your family or your church district or even settlement, some of the experiences I had in bab being baptized could be different. In our Amish settlement and family, it was expected of me to join church at age 17. I felt immensely pressured because of the ways in which I had observed people being treated who did not go after church. We didn't call it joining church. We called it gishtigmino because our language was PA Dutch, not English. And we said, we were going after church. That's how it properly translates. But anyways, because of the ways in which I had observed people being treated who did not go after church at the correct age because they were unsubmissive to the will of the Lord, there were many consequences. Some of the consequences I observed were allowing a certain color of paint on the bedroom of the person who didn't get baptized at the right time. After the person was baptized, the room was repainted with a more acceptable color. Many deep conversations being held with the person who was seen as unsubmissive to the will of the Lord and kind of stepping on the privilege of being born Amish by not complying with the demand of submitting to the will of the Lord and getting baptized at the right time. These conversations didn't just come from your family or ministry. It came from everybody around you and included the ministry. At the same time, Amish sermons often hammered down on the fear of being eternally damned and condemned to a place where there's an everlasting fire with eternal torment and gnashing of teeth. This was terrifying since I believe that when the ministry 
We had a bishop, two ministers, and a deacon. Got up to preach or perform their duties. They left themselves on the backless bench and God spoke through them. Another incident I observed was a boy who didn't get baptized at the right time, who got a green buggy seat. And he finally went after church. He was baptized. The next spring after he was baptized, the ministry got together at their, their timed um, convention where they uh, would rewrite the rules of the church and they wrote out green buggy seats. And every single young boy who had green buggy seats had to go change their buggy seats. He lost his green buggy seats. Seemed to me like that was a manipulation and a very co coercive way to show the ministry's power over the members of the congregation. I concluded that not only was it easier to get baptized at the right time, baptism was also something that could potentially help protect me from the abuse I was experiencing. Sadly, that was a lie. I believe it from the church and from my family and from the teachings that I had experienced from the earliest age. However, who knew religions could lie to you? Part of what would happen is that we would go after church in the springtime after we had our communion church. We called it Groski because we had communion twice a year in the spring and in the fall. So right after communion, we would start going after church. And it's important to note that some Amish may use different practices for joining church. However, all of the Amish I know of had church bi-weekly instead of weekly. For us, we started after Grosme in the spring, and every other Sunday we would have what I call special brainwashing sessions. I can hear it now. So there I was, a young, impressionable 17-year-old child who had been taught from the cradle from the moment that I drew my first breath that I was privileged to be born Amish. And because of this, we are a separate and peculiar people, and we are not of the world. We have the hope that we can someday go to heaven. And it is time, at 17 years of age, to get baptized, because that is the will of the Lord. And you just have to submit to the will of the Lord in your life. And when you do that, everything else will fall into place. So imagine this, a house filled with men and boys in the living room. And at the very back in the living room, on backless wooden benches, about 15 to 20 girls, aged 12 to 20, all arranged from eldest to youngest, lest we forget to honor our elders. The women, younger girls, and babies in the kitchen. We started off our holy day with a song led by a man because a woman could never lead in song during church, lest we forget that we were made from the rib and therefore could not lead in church services. It went something like this. And then everybody joined in. After a while, the bishop, the ministers, and the deacon got up as they did every other Sunday during church and filed through the kitchen and up the stairs. Shortly after that, the boys who were submitting to the will of the Lord got up and filed upstairs too. Then it was the girl's turn. There was another girl older than me, and she went first, because again, I shan't forget, she is my elder. I dutifully slumped my shoulders and bowed my head while trying to look appropriately submissive as I followed her upstairs. My thoughts were about my dress. Was it long enough? Was the apron string narrow enough? Were the folds in the back narrow enough? Was my dress being worn in the least likely way to induce lust? Did I pin my cake correctly enough to be worthy? These were some of the questions I thought of as I wa was walking carefully, so my hips didn't swing too much on my way to my special brainwashing session. About the third time we went, we promised that if we were found worthy of baptism, we would never tell church business to anyone not baptized in the church, including those we didn't associate with. Y'all want to guess who's winning at sinning? It's me. I'm a winner. <laughs> so
So anyways, I'm a winner at sin- sinning. That is a fact. We all know that, or we should know that, according to what I was taught in childhood. So that fall, we were found worthy of baptism. And I'd like you to picture a shed with backless wooden benches filled, men and boys facing women and children. For babies don't usually sit with their fathers until they're potty trained. With the baptism class in the center, all eyes on them, Late in the service, it was time. One by one, we all knelt. We folded our hands in our lap, we slumped our shoulders, and we bowed our heads. One by one, the bishop came around with the deacon in tow and poured some water on the boy's heads, then the girl's head, where the wife bustled up and took off her covering. So the covering that I wore was almost identical to this one. It was just black for us to be baptized properly. For if the water touched our covering, it would be ruined, and that could potentially take another eight hours to recreate. My white starch lawn apron and cape did get some water droplets on them. For anyone who knows, this destroys the carefully starched and ironed church apron and capes from the way they're supposed to be. For me, being baptized was expected a sign of submission and a ritual. In the years after I escaped, I attended various other churches, but to me, the majority of whom embrace the concept that in the concepts that enabled abuse to thrive, and I never became a member of another church. The most times I can recall attending the same church was three or less. Some of these churches told me I never received a true baptism and I needed to be born again. Some of them pressured me to engage in church activities up to four times a week. Y'all remember the every other week? We believed that if you um, spent too much time engaging in the Bible, you would be led astray. But I digress. By then, I was able to recognize the love bombing coming from churches, and I refused to engage with any of them when I recognized that. I eventually studied Buddhism, which led me to study Wicca, which was also not my way, because Wicca is just another organized religion. Very rigid in its thinking. I then studied eclectic paganism, which led me to become an atheist, and it still took almost a decade to be able to say, I am an atheist. I discovered in therapy, it was traumatic to even discuss and to begin dissecting the ritualistic and expected baptism. I knew the consequences of noncompliance with the expectation. It was safer for me to be baptized, and even if I felt some rush of the trance-like state that was induced from the effect of being worthy of baptism on display in front of the church, it was still traumatic. Many years later, as I navigated life in the aftermath of it all, I determined it might benefit me to redefine this ritual into something that not only reclaimed my Amish heritage, but also owned my own bodily autonomy. What I started with, I started pulling the things from the ritual that stuck out. There were three questions that were asked of me before I was baptized. While I don't remember to, uh, one of them. I do remember the first one. It was, do you believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? And we had to say yes, because we did believe in the Trinity. And the other one that I remember was, again, we had to promise not to tell church business to anybody not baptized in the church. And what I decided to do is create like three symbols, three statements of affirmation take back my own bodily autonomy and to do it in a way where I looked at the clothing that I was required to wear, the clothing that was constricting me and confining me to be this object that if I walk down the street, like people would slow down in their cars and take photographs of us, even as children. 
where if I walked wrong, if my hips were swaying too much, I actually had special sessions with my stepfather um, determining how I should walk in that dress. And some of these things came up as I started looking at how I'm going to reinvent this and make it into something that I can live with. And then I had to process that before I could even like begin rewriting the ritual. Because when you've had clothing be such a large part of you, you have to find a way to be okay with putting on the clothing that feels like it's oppressive, the clothing that feels like you're being objectified again. You're being looked at as an object. You're being fetishized. You're being looked at as something inherently sexual. And not just by people in your church, but also by people external to the church who fetishize the idea that all Amish women are submissive. I'm here to tell you we're not. Whether we're compliant or not, nope. Let me tell you about my grandmother. My grandmother was four foot 11. My grandmother, she used to tell everybody dynamite comes in small packages. Even people external to the settlement that she lived in knew that my grandmother was the one. My grandmother could make change happen. So we're, we're not silent. We're not submissive. People have just decided they need to speak for us. And part of that also meant that instead of having a man do something for me or take over a ritual for me, what I needed to do is actually speak for myself in my own ritual. I needed to write my own ritual. I needed to find a way to sort it out and yet still embrace that clothing. So what I ended up doing is spending months processing this in therapy, writing about it, all of the things that came out to include like being able to put on that covering again, being able to figure out a way that this allowed me to embrace who I am. And then I chose the specific clothing that I would wear. And what I did is I wore one of the dresses from an Amish settlement. And what I wore underneath it, well, that was just me being me. Does anybody want to guess what I wore underneath it? If you haven't seen it already. Does that mean? Well, Tammy, I guess you'll just have to find out. You'll have to find out. <laughs> I mean, it could have been a thong. It could have been. But it was kind of like one of those things, like doing this felt like it was it was me saying, no, I don't need men to speak for me. I don't need anybody to speak for me. And I don't need men to dictate what spiritual guidance I have or tell me who who I am or what I want in life or where to go. Like it felt like this was me saying, no, I, I reject the types of expectations that men have placed upon me in the name of the religion that I was a part of, that I was baptized into it. Part of it also was the positioning. When you look at the positioning and how we had to get down on our knees and fold our hands in our lap properly and slump our shoulders and bow our heads, like that was a really hard position for me to get into. But I determined it could benefit me and it did. And part of the reason that I made it public and part of the reason that I talk about it is because we did this in front of the entire congregation. So if you were being baptized and you had relatives that were in a different church district or a different settlement, you might have visitors coming just to view the baptism. They would be witnesses to the baptism. So everybody knew. And then it would be written into our newspapers because we have our own newspapers called The Budget and The Botschaft. And it would be written that Mary Byler was baptized on Sunday along with all of the rest of the, the ba baptism class. So it was very much a public event. It was something 
that was recorded publicly. So I felt like maybe the world could benefit from knowing how I've decided to unbaptize myself. Do we have time to watch this? I don't know if I can watch it, but let me know if y'all can hear this. And if you can't hear it, it's fine. Can't hear it? Okay. Let me do this. I will read this. I reject religious bondage. I reject ownership of people born with vaginas. I reject victimhood. I felt like that was especially important to reject vict victimhood. As in like, when you when you start talking about victimhood, one of the things that can come out is churches love to label people who talk about trauma as being victims and telling them that they are embracing victimhood. I'm so much more than a victim. I reclaim my power and bodily autonomy. I claim my birthright of being an Amish apostate. I destroy all gods placed above me. And then I ask myself three questions. Do you promise to free yourself from the chains of generations of indoctrination? I promise to free myself from the generations of indoctrination. I free myself. Do you promise to own and accept your perfectly imperfect self as you are? And I do. I own my perfectly imperfect self because nobody can ever be perfect, but I can surely own that I'm imperfect, but still kind of perfect. Do you promise to rise from the ashes of the fires that you were burned in? and own your voice and speak your truth. I vow to rise from the always from the ashes of the fires they burn me in. I will always rise. I vow to always speak and raise awareness of the sins of the Amish. I will own my voice and speak my truth. And as I will, so be it. I just want to know what y'all think of that outfit. What do you think it said to me? I'll give y'all a few minutes. Well, you know, even though I was wearing the modest dresses when I was repetitively raped as a child, those dresses did not protect me from sexual abuse, sexual assault, from abuse of all sorts and all types. But I was still blamed for it. And so part of that is me saying, I don't really give a F. Sorry, I'm cursing bad words, Janice. Is that okay? <laughs> and I also felt like this was one of the most meaningful endeavors I've ever undertaken because this was me taking what men did to me because our church leadership was all men. Our church was structured and giving men bodily autonomy, but then turning around and calling them animals or talking about their uncontrollable urges. And yet, they're not, they're not incapable of controlling themselves. But also, I don't have to live under that oppression. The layers of oppression, when you take off the layers of oppression, when you find a way to embrace who you are and to live in your truth and authenticity, you will find a joy and a freedom in living your life in ways you never dreamt could be possible. Mm. And then... The other part of this specific thing, the outfit that I'm wearing here, the corset, we were not allowed to wear corsets. It was it was written in our church rules. Matter of fact, when I escaped, did y'all know, did I ever tell any of you that I had to have somebody teach me how to size a bra? 
because I didn't know how to size a bra because I wasn't the one who would go and and make sure that I had a bra. So like, it's like one of those things that this sizing a corset is just a step up from what's really allowed to be worn. And the shiny pants. So I had to wear shiny pleather pants because we weren't allowed to wear shiny fabric because shiny fabric was of the devil. I don't know how we figured that out, but you know, I'm I'm just saying like the ministers were mouthpieces of God in a way, like, you know, they might be, maybe could lose their way and they could be put in their place sometimes by bringing in other ministry or even people would uh, dissent, groups of people would dissent and they'd have a split in church, but that was highly unlikely to happen. And in all of the settlements I lived in, pretty much shiny fabric was just the devil incarnate. It just wasn't good. And I I want to share too, like my feelings about this are very varied, but generally positive because I felt like I took back so much of me and who I am. And I felt like I got to do that. And I felt lucky because I'm in a place to do that. I have the support to do that. I had the therapist available to help me navigate through that. I had the support of other people outside of that to help me as I was rewriting the stuff. I was able to find outlets doing art and creative things like, like painting. I do do a lot of paintings. My whole house is filled with them. I feel like that's a um, an obsessive coping skill right now. But it's very helpful. And I would encourage everybody, if you've experienced a ritual like this or similar to this, to go find something, some way for you to take back your own bodily autonomy and your own power and take back your voice. I really would. I also think that I, I don't think any Amish bishop I've ever met would be willing to unbaptize someone or just allow them to leave without enforcing the bond in Midem. I was um, placed in the bond in 2004 after I reported abuse. And uh, some people say it's because I was baptized, but really was it because I was baptized or was it because they waited until after I reported the abuse and then didn't follow their own procedures for placing me in the bond? And so for me, it felt like in this, I am taking back part of my power over that as well, because they didn't follow policies and procedures that the church had in place to put me in the bond. That meant that part of my Amish identity was taken from me forcefully. And it wasn't just that way, but that was just one of the ways. And sometimes we are taught that if we don't comply with certain cultural and familial expectations, part of who we are is taken from us. And then people say, well, it's your fault. You knew that was the consequence. But is it really righteous or is it really holy if it's something that results in harming people and yet it's still done in the name of love, but yet it still harms people and it drives people to commit suicide? That's the reality of what shunning does. So rewriting the Amish baptism ritual that was performed on me as a 17 year old became this burning need and I just did it and I did it consciously. I did it intentionally. I had to not disassociate. That was a journey, but I didn't. And I dismantled every part of that ritual to reclaim me. And it has been just one of the tr most treasured acts of my life after religious trauma. It means a lot to me. That journey to be where and who I have become has taken so many twists and turns. As I've reclaimed my identity and my heritage in ways that don't compromise me, it's crazy. But pretty much, I get to be me without the trappings of a sin sifter covering. <sighs> 
and less moder moderator dresses, or you know, old world knee high socks from the stone ages. I do have to let you know the collarbone has failed to incite lustful gazes. My elbow boobs have currently been working over time to make up for lost time. My worldly and tempting ankle porn has not made a million yet, but I digress. It couldn't possibly be measured by monetary value. Thank you all for being present. It really means a lot to me. Thank you for your comments. It's it's amazing. I, I'm open for questions now. And we want to make sure people uh, get your book and see your book. And you said it's free today and tomorrow on Kindle. So yes. people, this is your opportunity uh, to get Mary's book. So use that um, QR code. Uh, your story is incredible. Were you wanting to show us there some of the head coverings that you wore? Oh, yes. Let me, can we make, well, this, this, the link to my book is also in the display. It's fine. Um, but if you can make me big, I'll show the coverings, some of the coverings. Yeah. I don't know oh. how to do that. Sue, are you there? Does Mary have to stop um, sharing her screen? Uh, yeah, right? I can stop sharing her screen. Right. Okay. Okay. Or Mary, actually, if you just want to stop there and I'll just spotlight the two of you. Oh, okay. There we go. There we go. Yeah, that works. So this... <clears throat> This is what we call the two-way pleated covering. And if you look at it in the back, the reason we called it two ways pleated is because first you pleated it this way. Like we would start off with it inside out. Let me let me really go here. And, and we would go by hand on the inside of this and we would pleat it very finely. So then once we were done, we would go across again, like about an inch apart and pleat it the other way. That's what those lines are. Can y'all see it? Yeah. That was done by hand. Yes. Wow. We, we did this by hand. And for our church Sunday coverings, like the one I was baptized in, the way that those were done, they were made out of satin, black satin. Because mm -hmm. we were not married women and we didn't go sit in the kitchen with the women we had to wear black coverings to church and just it's a whole thing it's crazy right so oppressive you don't say <laughs> someone <laughs> had a question uh for you that i don't know if i'd um heard you address before uh and they were referring to an accent because sometimes we've heard Amish folks uh, speaking English with an accent. And there, this person saying was was getting rid of your accent part of your rebaptism process, or were you aware of any kind of accent? Um. Well, my accent is really funny. Some people say I don't have an accent. Other people say they hear it when I talk. So it's not that I don't have an accent. It probably just feels familiar to you. Yes. Uh, okay. Someone says, can you speak at all about your feelings regarding the film Women Talking and other mainstream media depictions of Amish culture? Which mainstream media depiction? So Women Talking, I, I can talk about that, but please um, specify which mainstream media depictions of Amish in addition to that. Um, I, I want to point out that Women Talking is about Mennonites. Women Talking is also about Mennonites from somebody who is not a part of that settlement, and it is fiction. I mean, the the Mennonites that I personally have connections with who come from the settlement that um, it was written about, they feel very angry and betrayed by it because it's not an accurate depiction of what actually happened and because it's fiction and people celebrate it as such a wonderful thing. But it basically betrays the survivors in that story. Wow. Uh, what other 
I'm I'm asking specifically what other um, specific pieces of media are you talking about, like breaking Amish, um, et cetera. What about, uh, well, someone commented about the sins of the Amish. They said, I really think the sins of the Amish is amazing, really incredible to see the female pioneers standing up for women and children in the plain communities. Mary's presence in the film is incredibly powerful and moving. Thank you for everything you've shared, Mary. This is a better world with you in it. What a lovely thing to say. That is very lovely. Um, someone asking, did your, oh, pardon me, it's Dr. Ray. Did your organization practice um, Rumspringa or something like it? If I missed that, forgive me. All righty. First off, Rumspringa as depicted by media is partially a lie. Rumspringa is a lie for many older to Amish settlements. The idea is that Rumspringa is a time when we go get to go out into the world and experience the world. That is not actually true. In fact, the first time somebody asked me that question, I literally looked at them and I said, what do you mean? What do you mean? What are you talking about? You know why? Because what we called it was going with the young folks. We didn't get to go out and live in the world for a year and live the English. Rumspring is a myth that is good for business. Furthermore, if the idea of the world that you have is that all the world is is sex, drugs, rock and roll, and you go out and you drive cars and you live dressing English and you go out and party for a year, is that really living English or is that more or less just embracing stereotypes about the world? Is that saying that the world the um, dominant culture only holds like certain values and those values are all inherently evil because sex, drugs, rock and roll. So is it really living English? I'd ask you. Very but good question. The purpose of what going with the young folks was to get married. We would go with the young folks. So I went with the young folks before I was baptized. Literally the reason I didn't talk about Rumspringa is because I knew somebody was gonna ask me about it. I just knew it. Anyways, but we would go out um, on Sunday nights. Every Sunday night, we would have what we called a singing. And then like, there would be dating. Some parents would set rules of like, oh, you can't date until you're 18 or whatever. Our age was 17. Some of the settlements I lived in, the age was 16. Furthermore, some of the settlements I lived in practice bed courtship. If you don't know what that is, it's um, bundling, the practice of bundling. They basically go to bed together after the singing. After we had we were done singing, like we would sing for like an hour at this family's home. After we were done singing, the girls would go out to the wash house. The boys would go out to the barn. We'd hang around for a little bit. Um, if somebody wanted to go on a date, a boy would send two of his friends to go ask this girl. So they would take the girl aside with these two guys and they would ask her if he could take her home. That's how you got asked to go on a date. The settlement that I went to the young folks with, we specifically were supposed to sit at the kitchen table across from each other. Some families said you had to um, light a lamp. You weren't allowed to sit in the dark. However, I dated a guy, let's call him Henry. I was supposed to marry him the summer that I escaped in February. The summer of 2004, I was supposed to marry him. I did not marry him. But in Henry's community, they were wild. They played volleyball on Sunday afternoons. Not only that, wait until you hear how they dated. What they did is the boy was supposed to go sit in the living room on a big chair, and then the girl was supposed to go sit in his lap. But you're not supposed to have premarital sex, and we don't get a sex education. Wow. Okay. I think I'm done on Room Springer right now. Thank you. Um, that's that's amazing. You're, you're, thank you for an insider's look into those things we do have someone asking 
Um, do you know anything about, okay, I'm hearing a lot of overlap with the Bruderhof who used to claim to be cousins of the Amish. I haven't found a support group or website specifically for them. Do you know anything about them or have any suggestions for people from not well-known groups uh, like the Amish and the Bruderhof? All, all I could think of was the Plain People's podcast, but do you know of... So the thing about the Bruderhof is, mm -hmm. is they're, they are our Anabaptist cousins. I don't know of any specific organization or group that supports them. But I do know that I have some followers. Um, I host a podcast on YouTube where we talk about various Anabaptist journeys. And you're always welcome to come share because sometimes what happens with Anabaptists, because we are very much oratory, we are oral storytellers, that is our, our heritage, we do this. Um, what happens is, is when we start talking about our experiences, other people might come around and they might reach out and they might talk, connect with you and you might be able to figure out like, are there actually resources? I can always ask on our social media, but I don't specifically know. Oh, and one more thing about um, Rumspringa. I'm going back there. Somebody said, well, not Amish. We were taught we would have a board on edge that put between us with a hole in it so we could talk to each other but not touch. Y'all, when when the girl went to go to bed in the, in the bed courtship settlements, um, she had a special nightgown that she would iron the Saturday before. Not only that, there wasn't necessarily a board in between them. I'm just saying, because I, I mean, like, have y'all met teenagers? How many teenagers do you know that comply with the board in between them? <clears throat> At 17, 16. Can, can, can you uh, talk a little bit about some of the research that you have done before? I think it's so important. Oh, the research? Yeah, I'm, I'm springing it on you. I'm uh, I'm sorry. I just I know well, that the work that you're doing is very important in helping uh, children. Mm -hmm. So in 2021, I became certified to do research, and I co-wrote a research study on child sexual abuse within Amish, Mennonite, Anabaptist, and other religious communities. Part of what came out of that is that over 300 people responded who were raised in Anabaptist homes of various types. Out of this 300, over 300 people, there were still 177 who are active on Anabaptists today. As a whole, 47% of the people who responded, which means about one in two of the people who responded said they had experienced child sexual abuse. And I would caution you to remember that sometimes um, people who have been sexually abused as a child might be more interested and more invested in research about child sexual abuse. Maybe that could be part of the reason why, but we also don't know without um, questioning the entirety of Anabaptist communities, which is not physically possible. So for right now, for the people who responded, that is the rate that we have. The other part is, is that there's a language difference. As I mentioned, um, English is my second language, PA Dutch is my primary language. And we ask our participants uh, if child sexual abuse, if they were taught child sexual abuse was a sin, if they said yes, they then went on and were asked an additional question about what they called it. What were the names for it? Some of the things that came out of that was like moral failure. There were some who were correct, but those were very rare. There were a lot of moral failure, um, non-consensual sex, or some, it was thought, that some of them, the girl was evil, sent by the devil to tempt church leadership. But another part of that is, is that we also ask if they were taught it was a crime. And it seems to be, 
potentially that teaching your children that child sexual abuse is a sin and a crime if you're in a religious community could be helpful in preventing child sexual abuse. But I also had to ask the question, if they were taught that it was a sin, does that also mean that they were taught other things like their body parts? Because some of the respondents also said that they didn't have words for it. They didn't talk about it. You know, you you did a whole podcast with me. Do you have questions, Dennis? More questions? I I um, would like you to remind everyone what your podcast is called. Um, it's the Misfit Amish on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And we are also on Spotify and Apple. And um, another thing is, is in our exhibit, that word I can't say. You want to say the word? The, the, ex the exhibit hall? Yes. Um, in our booth, like these slides that I made, the last part of the slides is actually resources if you want information, more information. And those slides are available for download. Please feel free to go grab whatever you need. But I do think it's important that people have access to information. And so I wanted to make sure that I provided some recommended resources. The research is listed as unpublished right now. We are still working on revisions and we're hoping to submit it for publication sometime before the end of this year or early next year. There are books listed. There are podcasts listed. There are, um, on our website, there are printable resources that anybody can download and print and disseminate around public places, around Amish settlements. They're specifically made because in 2021, Jasper Hoffman and I, Jasper Hoffman is from the Plain People's Podcast, and her and I got together. We spearheaded a project where we went to Amish abuse awareness meetings. And we um, collected information about what was missing from the teachings that they were providing. And so we created these resources based on that. And we also considered the fact that English is the second language and the fact that people who grow up in religious environments might utilize English differently than, say, somebody else would. Like if, if some of the things I say in English come out wrong, I'm telling you, they don't come out right. I may sound okay right now, but yeah. Sometimes I'll tell my kids something like the trash is all and my kid's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> trash bags are all, I'm just saying. <laughs> Anybody have a struggle with that? The trash bags are all? <laughs> I love it that you um that you did such a a powerful action as your own unbaptism. I think that is so significant, so important. Uh I mean perhaps maybe even as important as writing a book and you know breaking that vow or that covenant not to discuss things uh, with outsiders. And boy, oh boy, you have just gone to town with that. It's amazing. Well, see, I wrote my book as like a big middle finger to people who <laughs> have used. <laughs> Let's be real. All right, y'all. I want everybody to guess what song. I wrote my book in two weeks and I listened to one song on repeat. I'm slightly autistic here. Slightly. Okay. What song do you think it was? Mm. And I'm going to tell you why I wrote my book while y'all guess. Pour Some Sugar on Me by Death. <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh, you're going really gentle. Nope, nope. That wasn't it. So um, it says Freedom from George Michael? Nope, nope. I wrote my book because... Since I began speaking out against the child abuse and child sexual abuse, specifically in Amish settlements in 2004, the amount of times people have used my trauma for their own benefit and gain, and they have removed aspects like, didn't you enjoy hearing about my grandmother? They won't write about that. Media will not write about my grandmother. 
they won't write about the people that I want them to write about too. So I wrote my book to tell my story and my life experiences in a way that I feel comfortable having it out there because it talks about the things that I experienced, but it also talks about the things that kept me alive, the people who kept me alive. That's why I wrote my book. Nobody else has guesses for this song? Come on. <laughs> Let me down now. <laughs> now I'm on I, pins I, and needles. What is it? What is it? <laughs> oh, weird, weird Al Amish. No, no, no. Yeah, you're going. It's absolutely. Think religious <laughs> trauma thought, songs. <laughs> I don't know. I will survive, someone says. Nope, that's that's a closer guess, Tammy, Tammy, but that's, no. No clue. No clue. Marvin Gaye, sexually, oh, that's a good song, but no, it wasn't that. <laughs> Tara, do you see what? Are you talking about what? Yep, yep. <laughs> that <Yep>. naughty Daryl. <laughs> I mean, I do listen to that song, but no, it wasn't that song. Oh, someone's saying a playlist of songs on religious trauma would be very helpful. I, I have a whole playlist on CPTSD oh. on Spotify. Okay. Please tell okay. us what your song was. Y'all don't laugh too hard. Too late. Okay. Losing my religion. Yes, of course. That makes perfect sense. I can't believe I didn't think of that. <laughs> Yo, we're in a religious trauma conference. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, that was great. Losing my religion. Yes. That's yeah. me in the corner. <laughs> Yeah, I I was wondering about when you left, um, like when you escaped, uh, was it, did you find it hard to uh, first appear in public in kind of regular clothes? Oh my God, you want to hear the funniest thing? When I went out dressed in my Amish garb, men would be horrifically awfully objectifying when i started dressing like a normal person on the street they stopped doing that wow that made it so much easier yeah. it was wow. shocking though yeah and i did find out like for me it was very helpful to like not have that constant attention i mean like it was terrible I, I think it's something that needs to be discussed is the objectification. I recently had a podcast guest who actually talked about being um, asked to wear their plain intimate, their plain garb during sexy times because mm -hmm. after they escaped, their partner got with them because they thought that a plain woman was supposed to be this kind of way. And then was like, I want you to wear your plain dress for sexy times, because apparently this is a fetish and we should all be making money, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, um, definitely we see in the evangelical Christian community, there is a, a sort of um, fetishizing of and worshipping of what they think is Amish culture. They they hearken it back to the good old days when everything were, was pure and all that kind of stuff. But apparently that's grossly inaccurate. <laughs> Well, I have to wonder sometimes if it's because there's certain men inside of conservative Christianity who believe that Amish women are, are Amish people as a whole are closer to God and Amish women specifically fall under the umbrella of protection. So it's like, you know, God, the ministry, the church and and um, their husband or their father, like the the ways in which we are controlled are absolutely like when you get married so one of the things that i was told is when you get married you have to do whatever your husband says whenever he wants to because then like ownership passes passes over to your husband 
And even if they're not in an Amish setting, they look at Amish as upholding those values. And so they look at Amish women as being specifically trained and amazing. And they um, stereotype us all into being submissive, good little wives. Mm. Do you think that's a part of it? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody have thoughts? But someone is asking about your playlist of the trauma songs, too. Is that anything that you would ever um, share? I think it might be public on Spotify, to be honest. I might be able to grab you a link. Okay. Wow. And uh, Mary, I think you also attended last night, Dr. Danielle Kramer, the sex therapist and sexologist. She was talking about uh, women being objectified um, as well. And I wondered what you thought. Oh, thank you for sharing that. There's your playlist. I wondered what you thought of Dr. Kramer's um, talk about sexuality and misogyny and all those things. Well, I think there was a lot of different there was a lot of language around it. I have to go back and re-listen to it, but there was a lot of language around it that it was a lot to take in at once. Mm -hmm. And part of it was, is like inherently, I've, I've experienced this thing when I talk about the lived experiences of Amish women, where I get people from the outside who've never been Amish. They're like, oh, I'm a driver for the Amish. I know about the Amish. You know, we're all laughing at you. You don't know what you're talking about. And And then there's people who are like, Oh, no, let me tell you about the Amish. Or there's people who say things like, one time I was on an abortion panel and I shared like my experience with an abortifacient. And um, the host actually responded with, you know, as you were talking, I was just looking around at all of my Amish furniture and thinking about how much I love it. Like, I thought about that when she was speaking too, mm. because I'm like, you know, why do people do that? Mm. And and is that similar across different branches of conservative Christianity, or is it just Amish people? I'm not sure. I don't know. People trying at some to make a connection at uh, at some point. Sometime I'd love to talk with you about that panel, the abortion panel. Um, that you were on. I think we're pretty much at the end of our time. I hope that you did see that Mary included uh, her Spotify list there. I encourage you to take a look at it. I do encourage you all to also watch Dr. Danielle's Kramer from last night. It was very interesting, uh, fascinating talk. Um, and I think we have come pretty much to the end of our time with Mary. We are going to have a short break. Make sure you check out the exhibit hall and everything that's offered in there. Mary, people are so appreciative, as am I, that you shared today your experiences. Thank you so Thank you much for the opportunity. It was. Great I mean, to go see get you your again. free copy of my Kindle book. I don't even care if you read it; just get a free copy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> okay, everyone. We'll see you again in fifteen minutes. <laughs> <laughs>